name is Jeannie Maddox Tangara, I'm a professor of history at Howard University, where I do African history and African diaspora history. I was fortunate to have a Fulbright uh, fellowship to Cote d'Ivoire. It was actually Fulbright Hayes. And um, more recently, I was fortunate to become a Fulbright Scholar Ambassador. And so I spent a little time going around promoting Fulbright programs at various institutions in the U.S. Um, today, my responsibility is to introduce this illustrious panel of dynamic women involved in, in some very important fields, making some very special contributions uh, to the nation, um, and of course, bringing diversity to our conversation. And that's the goal of our panel today, so I will introduce them. Um, can I hand our technician to remove what's here? I'll only start to use There's a window here. Uh, so first, uh, to my immediate left here is Dr. Francis Colon. Uh, she is Deputy Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary of State at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Dr. Francis Colon um, uh, promotes into the integration of science and technology into foreign policy dialogues, global scientific engagement for capacity building, the advancement of women in science, and innovation as a tool for economic growth around the world. Previously, Dr. Colon served as the U.S. Department of State as the Science and Environment Advisor at the Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, where she was responsible for advising on environmental and scientific issues that affected the U.S. government's foreign policy objectives in the Americas. Dr. Colon earned her PhD in Rural Science from Brandeis University and her Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Puerto Rico. Welcome. Guest is uh, Aziza al -Hibri, Professor Emerita at the University of Richmond School of Law. She served on the faculty there from 1992 until her retirement in 2012. Her work has centered on developing an Islamic jurisprudence and body of Islamic law that are gender equitable and promote human rights and democratic governance. Uh, Professor Al Hebri has authored numerous book chapters, essays, and law review articles on these subjects, and her work has appeared in the highly respected Journal of Law and Religion, uh, the Harvard International Review, and the University of Pennsylvania Journal of Constitutional Law, among other things. In 2011, Professor Al Hebri was appointed by President Obama to serve as commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Professor al Hebri is the founding editor of Hypatia, a journal of feminist philosophy, and the founder and president of the organization Karama, uh, Muslim Women Lawyers for Human Rights. Uh, Professor al Hebri was a Fulbright Scholar in 2001. So let's welcome her. Our third guest on this panel is the Honorable Maureen Duffy Lewis, a judge in the Los Angeles County Superior Court since 1987. Uh, the Los Angeles Superior Court is regarded uh, as the single largest trial bench in the world. Judge Duffy Lewis has experience both as a civil litigator and a deputy district attorney in Los Angeles. As an attorney, she has tried over 100 jury trials with over a 98% success rate. Uh, as a judge, she currently sits in a civil court of unlimited jurisdiction, handling many nationally and globally recognized cases. She was a highly regarded felony trial judge in the previous assignment. Judge uh, Duffy Lewis is the initial chair of judicial, the Judicial Monitoring Initiative, uh, that was from 2009 to 2010, in Bulgaria. Uh, this program is in cooperation with the United States Department of Justice and the Bulgarian Institute for Legal Initiatives. 
She is a two-time Fulbright awardee to Bulgaria. And while in Bulgaria, she initiated and developed a report related to the mediation program. It has been called by the European Union as one of its top three improved programs. While teaching her Fulbright class on American law at Sophia University uh, in the law program, uh, her classes were five times the anticipated enrollment. Don't we all wish that? <laughs> and uh, her students have excelled in the Bulgarian legal community and within the EU. Her students are now lawyers, legislators, and teachers. Her students leave the country and the EU in the international moot court competitions. A handful of her students became coaches for the national mock trial team. Uh, their students most recently won the best brief in the American and International Moot Court competition in Washington, D.C. She continues to lecture and publish. So let's welcome Judge Deputy. Audience, prepare yourselves to ask questions as well. Um, so first of all, we'd like to know what influenced your career path and how you got involved in your chosen professions. So let's start here with um, uh, Professor uh, So good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming to this event. It's so nice to see so many committed folks, Alyssa and Alana. Um, I'm a scientist by training. Scientist. Sure. I have a background as a neuroscientist and I became interested in science as my chosen field. I think early on I had a really magnificent teacher that made a tremendous difference um, in my life and that set me on the course for choosing science, uh, choosing it as a career. But I think in the middle of doing my PhD, um, I felt a very strong need to connect what I was learning and what I was doing at the bench, at the research bench, with people in my community. And I wasn't clear that I was going to have the opportunity to do that by just doing research, partly because uh, the academic environment for science can tend to be very narrow in scope, uh, you're very limited to your field, and because it doesn't promote um, speaking beyond the confines of the ivory tower about your science. Um, and so I chose a science path in policy as a result. I wanted to use my science background uh, to help people directly. And so I made the choice uh, when I finished my degree to come to DC and make that transition into science and technology and innovation policy. Um, I very much wanted to be able to have a more direct impact on these issues that I felt so passionate about. So that is how I ended up uh, working uh, in the issues I work in now. That is how I ended up in my current position. I did a fellowship of the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, that matches PhDs <coughs> in hard sciences with government uh, offices where they and I act as advisors and consultants directly on these issues. So that's what I've dedicated the last uh, 11 years of my life to. Um, I've been advising on international science and technology policy. Um, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience um, speaking to leaders from around the world about how they can incentivize innovation ecosystems, how they can build the capacity of their people to take on their own challenges, and how we might do that as a concerted effort, because no one country can go it alone. Um, and it's been just very, very rewarding. I have loved every, every single minute of my public service. Thank you for that. Dr. Al Hebe, I see from your file that you've got many professors do, and that's from your desk. 
you manage the world. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about your career path. Well, um, I should mention that I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, which when I was born in it was the Switzerland of the Middle East, <laughs> when there was in Switzerland. <laughs> Um, my career was in some ways initially haphazard, but not quite. Uh, I come from a family of learning, a house of learning, and we had perhaps one of the best libraries in the country for various types of research. So when I graduated with distinction from my American School for Girls, and wanted to go to university, my father said, what for? You have the whole library here. <laughs> so I had to think quickly, and I said, you know, I've always wanted to be a journalist. I ended <coughs> literature um, author. I published when I was 14 already in mainstream journals. But when he asked, said that to me, I said, oh, but I really want to be a physicist. Can you get me a lab? <laughs> and he said, no, I just won't. <laughs> So I went to the American University of Beirut and studied physics and loved it. But uh, at one point, and by the way, I have a lot of affinity for that reason to science and technology and, and philosophy. I decided that I want to go back to arts and sciences. And the closest thing I could shift my credits to was philosophy because logic is very close to the set theory in math I was preparing for in my physics. So I ended up being in uh, philosophy. And I came to the United States and had a wonderful education in that field, and I arrived here in the 60s, and that's when I got to meet all my friends in the feminist movement and the civil rights movement. You know, it was the perfect time to come to this country and get involved, uh, and really uh, understand what this country is about, because it's, it was in the middle of change and dialogue and you know so really got into the middle of this and so i started writing a lot about the feminist movement and at one point i noticed that my sisters in the feminist movement have gone international <coughs> and they wanted to liberate the muslim woman and i'm thinking like then we tell men not to try to liberate us, we have our own voice and we liberate ourselves. So why are my sisters not trying to liberate the Muslim women when they don't give them their voice? Mm -hmm. And so I thought, time to give the Muslim women their voice as an American and as a Muslim, I probably could do that, let me try. And so that's when I formed the organization Karama, which means dignity. And we went internationally, we were uh, at the, uh, uh, Mid-Decade for Women uh, uh, and various other meetings of the UN and actually met with a lot of Muslim women from around the world who were brought into these conferences by their governments mostly and took the government line. But what I was doing was something completely different. I've always had a problem following somebody and obeying. Um, so I had my own views about <coughs> having come from a house of learning, what does my religion say about women? And what everybody thought it was saying, whether they were Muslim or non-Muslim, they were wrong. And I can prove it. So I started doing that. And the women internationally started feeling like they're breathing fresh air. And the women in the US, the Muslim women in the US, I found out are also in need of help. And we can talk about that a little bit more. And at that point, I realized that just being a philosopher and writing about things is not sufficient. I needed to get on the ground doing something. I went to law. <laughs> and that's where uh, I ended up. And that's what we're doing now in our organization legally trying to help people and jurisprudentially around the world and in the United States. So thank you for that. Um, John uh, Duffy Lewis, uh, one can advocate from the bench, as we know, but here you have taken American jurisprudence abroad. And now we have all these wonderful students that have been trained by you. Tell us a little bit about how you got there. I, my last name is Duffy. I married Mr. Lewis. My father was so shocked when I didn't take the last name Lewis alone. So I grew up in a time when women got married and took their husband's last name. 
um, I was shocked that they would be shocked because I was Maureen Duffy. And so I just added Mr. Lewis, so Maureen Duffy Lewis. My mother was Sicilian, 4, 11, and 92 pounds. My father was 6'1", blonde, blue eyed, a tall guy, bigger than life. And the two of them standing together was just shocking to people. So shocking that I remember my mom telling me about discrimination. See, it comes in all forms. Short, dark Italian woman, tall, blonde, blue-eyed Irishman. Maureen Duffy married Ronald Lewis. I grew up in this family where women didn't have a voice. Because if you didn't have an advanced degree in an Italian family, they were like, what is she talking about? Of course, I was only three or four years old. <laughs> and I probably shouldn't have been butting my nose into these conversations. But I never missed an opportunity to be heard. And one day, um, the immigrant family, my, my mother's family, well, both sides of my family are immigrant families, and uh, they produced on the Italian side nine lawyers. So do you think that they understood about accessing justice in the American way? So there I was one morning, as my mother was already cooking pasta sauce, and my uncle was visiting from New York. He was a judge. And I told him a few things uh, that were on my mind, and he goaded me into an argument. And he wanted to see how I performed. I performed so well, my mother sent me to my room. <laughs> That was the day that I decided I was going to be a judge. Because my mother told me I had to listen to him because he was a judge. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's as corny as it comes, but it is true. In a courtroom, you have a captured audience. You do have a voice. Now, if you wish to make yourself a horse's ass with that voice, anything is possible. But that was my, my steps to becoming a judge were kind of out of the ordinary. My mother was a professional ballet dancer, and I was an original member of an American ballet, American folk. I danced in the ballet until I was 16, then I started choreography for the opera. I went off to college where they were completely sure I had no ability for letters, arts, or sciences. I often remark it must have been my D in Algebra 1 three times that they thought I didn't have college material going on up in between my ears. But my mom said, once you get interested, you'll get going. And I did find those things that were interesting. When I got to college, I realized that this was a full-time contact sport. As a woman in a class, there were more men, and I just had to perform. And I did what it took to perform because I knew I needed that voice. I went off to law school. There were 40 women out of 300 men in my class, and my female professor, the first woman graduate of my law school, called me Mr. Duffy, and guess what? I answered. <clears throat> I just didn't care how they saw me. I just wanted to make sure they saw me. And there I was in law school, knowing every day what I wanted to do. I taught school. I became a school teacher so that I could support myself through law school, and I started law school at night. Everything I ever learned as a school teacher made my life as a lawyer possible. My juries were my classrooms. I could break anything down, or I would try to break the most complex things down to the straightforward. I loved teaching, and teaching was just the outward expression to me of being a trial lawyer, or vice versa. <coughs> but I became a trial lawyer, and I loved every moment of it. People listened even if I didn't have such a great position. I respected the listener, and that's what I learned in the classroom. And when I moved on to the bench, 
I think my opportunity to listen to great lawyers and thank them for their presence in the courtroom because they were truly the voice of the voiceless. I think of myself as a three-year-old that was almost victimized with no voice. I look at the people who try to access justice down at the courthouse now, and those, vo those voices, we need a lawyer, and I'm grateful for those lawyers who come in. So they've allowed me to meet and see some of the greatest trial lawyers in the world in my courtroom. I'll leave you with this one thing. From the time I didn't have a voice to the time I had the ultimate voice, and I say ultimate because you can abuse people with a voice, right? I tried some cases that left me breathless. Korea Supply versus Lockheed. It was a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, breach of contract, over the current development of the monitoring system over the DNC. It's now being implemented and it covered every aspect. Software, hardware, jets, land, sea, satellite. Every aspect of it was fought out in my courtroom. It was mesmerizing. Thank you. in their various fields. So the next question has to do with um, how they perceived the environment within which they work now. And of course, as women, as part of their diversity, um, origins also as part of diversity and such, the, the question has to do how they define their own diversity and how and, and what, what they perceive they could actually bring to the table. And in answering this question, if you don't mind, could you also tell us how Fulbright principles may have helped guide the way in the way you managed your position in these environments? Let's start with um, Judge Duffy. I loved teaching, and teaching was just the outward expression to me of being a trial lawyer or vice versa. So I became a trial lawyer, and I loved every moment of it. People listened, even if I didn't have such a great position. I respected the listener, and that's what I learned in the classroom. And when I moved on to the bench, I think my opportunity to listen to great lawyers and thank them for their presence in the courtroom because they were truly the voice of the voiceless. I think of myself as a three-year-old. I was almost victimized with no voice. I look at the people who try to access justice down at the courthouse now, and those, vo those voices, you need a lawyer, and I'm grateful for those lawyers who come in. So they've allowed me to meet and see some of the greatest trial lawyers in the world in my courtroom. I'll leave you with this one thing. From the time I didn't have a voice to the time I had the ultimate voice, and I say ultimate because you can abuse people with a voice, right? I tried some cases that left me breathless. Korea Supply versus Lockheed. It was a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act breach of contract over the current development of the monitoring system over the DNC. It's now being implemented and it covered every aspect. Software, hardware, jets, land, sea, satellite. Every aspect of it was fought out in my courtroom. It was mesmerizing.
may have helped guide the way in the way you managed your position in these environments. Let's start with um, Judge Duffy. Um, Fulbright changed my life. The principles of Fulbright were easy for me to express because they were me. I was waiting to take the things that I had learned in life and find others who are interested in that conversation. I went to Bulgaria and um, my comrades there, my the hardworking judges that I met and business people and government people that I met there, all wanted to have a conversation and that's half the battle. I reminded my friends there that I was there to work with them, not impose or tell them how smart I was or how I understood all those processes. Bulgaria and the court system allowed me to bring all the things that I had learned in the Los Angeles Superior Court about how to run a court, how to be transparent, how to keep the cases moving, how to utilize mediation, how to train judges in mediation, how to put together referrals, cases for mediation in order to get the matters done in a reasonably prompt time. And Fulbright allowed me to be there and share that kind of information with them and meet people who wanted that information. I laughed one day when my, one of my colleagues now, who is Minister of Justice, who resigned when he realized that he couldn't do it as a one-man lifting. You always need a group there. Any, in any reasonable organization, you need a group. He couldn't get enough buy-in for his lifting. So he's resigned, but I, recently, this last year, but my colleague said, you know, Maureen, when the USAID shows up, they come with some great ideas. And I said, I come with no money. This is the joy of Fulbright. I come with me and my ideas and my willingness to share them. So that's how Fulbright principles um, worked with me and how they in, informed my presence in my Fulbright location. Doesn't just mean I'm still, at, I'm still in Bulgaria. No, everywhere I go, those are the kinds of things that work. When you share yourself, you share your knowledge, and you make sure that your partners buy into it and that they understand it and want to share too. Otherwise, it withers the day you leave. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Professor Elmi Green, uh, could you take that a step further in terms of the best practices that we learned as well brothers? Um, I'm going to start with how I perceive my environment, which you put forth. Um, the environment keeps on changing. Nothing in life is constant. So if it isn't one thing, it's the other. <laughs> and a lot of what I faced early on in life was mostly um, sexism. I remember that at every point in my career, as a student, whether in Lebanon, or in the US in philosophy, or in the US in law, or on Wall Street, I've always been given the advice to drop out and get married and, and go home because I was married and have a nice life. You know, like why in one in one case in, in my career in the US, the chairman of my department asked me, why are you taking the position of somebody else who has to uh, really support his family? Yeah. You're well to do, your husband is well to do. Go home and take care of it. Yeah. There were other things, like when I did very well. People wondered whether it was because of my looks or my legs. You, know, you have to remember, I'm older than most of you. There weren't laws at that time to protect against sexism. And I, you know, had to deal with a lot of that. How did I view myself? I thought I was good looking, I was smart, and I had a lot of opportunities, and I'm going to do what I think I should do. Did I see myself as diverse? No. Somebody else saw me as diverse. I am me. Um, and I went through life that way. And if somebody treats me differently, it's their problem. So I always 
was brought up to think that your life has no value if you don't use it to help others. That's the motto of my family. And for me, even when I was a kid, at six years old, having conversations with my, within my family, I also spoke for the women. And I don't understand how I could have so early on <coughs> been a feminist, but I remember clearly that I shocked everybody in the room, and they respected that. So I devoted a lot of my life, not only to women, but also to a just society and a democratic society where everybody would have a fair uh, opportunity. And what I noticed is that in my, when I started writing and people started reading about those writings, uh, they really got influenced and affected. We don't know this. We write something and we think, okay, so it's published. But I'm getting emails. Yesterday I got one from the Philippines. Before that, Maldives. A lot from the Middle East, everywhere. Who are following my articles? Thank God for the internet, because how else would they have seen that? It is broadening minds. It is creating a better understanding and bridging among civilizations. Because I always talk as an American. Even when I go into areas where Americans are not um, regarded positively, I try to be the nice American they can identify with and love, and therefore build bridges. I try to open their minds in my work about different interpretations, about diversity, about issues of democracy. That democracy is not really an American thing. It is a global thing but that we forget where we came from, uh, intellectually. So I will share with you one comment I received from, although I never speak on this topic, but this is an email that I got from one embassy, US embassy, that had invited me to visit a foreign country. And they told me that uh, after I left, it seems that President Obama has met with some women from that country, and some of them were women I had talked to. And the embassy did not recognize one of the women because she used to cover, and she was no longer covered. And they asked her why, and she said, but Dr. Al-Hibri doesn't, and she's a good Muslim, so I can be the same. Now, I don't advocate anything on this issue, but the embassy went on to say, this is really interesting. Because at the same time, when you were in this country, you met with women who were niqab, they covered their face, and they were being discriminated against. And you, are, you went to the Commission of Human Rights to defend them. And so that's really what America is about. You don't just defend what you believe in, you, believe, you defend the right of everybody to believe what they have the right to believe in. So I was very happy that I'm creating this balance of understanding democracy, freedom of belief, etc. abroad, uh, and that I'm also trying to interpret that in an American way in the United States. So I feel that I'm doing a lot of the things that the Fulbright uh, uh, principles call for. Dr. Cologne, and I can hardly wait to tell us how you brought your bridge building and the sense of mutual exchange uh, to your work as well. Um, so I, how I view diversity, or how I view diversity in my environment, I'm a Hispanic woman who chose the science field, who moved from Puerto Rico to Boston to pursue her PhD, um, Everything. Check, check. One more. I married a Sikh man who wears a turban every day, and that's how we walk around. Um, yeah, diversity is every, every day in my life, every minute. It just, just, it just is. Um, I didn't view myself as a Hispanic woman growing up because 100% of the people around me growing up in Puerto Rico were Hispanic. So you don't think of yourself in that environment as a minority, because I wasn't. Um, and then, obviously, I became 
aware. I remember becoming aware during grad school and how that happened. I remember the moments it happened. Um, the moment I, I was called to go to the animal facilities, we did experiments uh, on animals. So there's an animal facility where the vet takes care of the animals that are used for the experiments. And you have to go down there and sometimes get into training or talk about how we're managing the facility, treatment of the animals, etc. And that day, for some reason, in my process of awakening, was beginning. I didn't know how to react to things yet. I didn't know how I would. I hadn't yet had that moment where you first call something out or stand up for something. But this was it. That day, the vet said, I want to talk to you guys about the conditions in the rat cages. We're putting too many rats per cages. It is starting to look like a barrio in there. So there's that moment. That moment happens. Whether it's a gender thing, whether it's an ethnic thing, whether it's that moment happens. And I waited till the meeting. He said, does anybody have anything else? Uh, we're adjourned. And I said, I have something. I said, I would like to request you consider your words the next time you address us. Because comparing a rat cage to the place where I grew up seems less than appropriate. It took 
listening to wise counsel from women leaders in the science fields from across the country. We've been doing this work for a long time. I appreciate those great mentors. It took me sitting in that chair, being the chair of the selection committee, and holding people accountable for the views that they were espousing when we were doing the closed door selection and speaking about the candidates. It took being deliberate. So um, I guess this week, maybe the, the one message I, I can say and that I'm allowed to say, um, I think is that I have been doing my job in a deliberate manner to take these diversity issues into account. Um, and that that's what I feel I'm there to do, to protect science, technology, innovation, um, and to protect these issues of diversity and be deliberate about them and not let things slide. I have decided to not let anything slide. Um, the last example I will uh, quote was the gentleman who was managing one of our programs. It was a fellowship program that diversity rates weren't that great for. And when I called him in so that we could go over our diversity strategy for that program, and this is why I feel very strongly about the need to be deliberate and stand up for these things every day, is that he looked at me and said, Professors, you must understand, blacks don't want to work in government. Um, and that moment where I looked back at this person and said, excuse me, <laughs> our president? <laughs> questioned him further and took that on. And so it's, it's not just the public service, it's not just the science policy work, it's the other things that we are called to do beyond. The, our job description, that is what I feel extremely, uh, maybe especially sensitive to this week. Thank you. is that people don't understand what these rights are. People outside the tradition are influenced by Orientalist writing, and that is a problem in itself. Then people within the tradition have been through a lot of uh, factors, including moving away from democratic governance that was established early on in Muslim countries, and therefore forcing the people uh, to follow certain ways of thinking and um, dumbing down the population to the extent that many of them really don't have a direct relationship with the important documents in their religion. So that then what they are following is tribal practice and not the religion itself. And so we see a lot of things that are really oppressive to women such as many women did not know when I started writing many years ago. Now people know. Um, they didn't know that the woman, if she is in an unhappy marriage, she could herself initiate a divorce. <laughs> Always women thought that it was the man who could do it, and he could do it verbally, just say you're divorced and she's done. They never thought that they could do it themselves, to extricate themselves from the situation. They also didn't know that they have choices of what divorce they can choose in order to preserve their lives. And some of these cases came up in American courts, and I was an expert witness <coughs> on religion who testified, <coughs> and I have to clarify this because there's a lot of 
really um, wrong-headed talk about Sharia law and the courts. That American courts know only one thing, which is American law. Mm -hmm. When you have a contract, um, and it is you know the law of American contracts, the judge might want an interpret an explanation as to what is in the contract. That's when expert testimony comes for items that he does not know about, such as uh, the rules of divorce in the contract that are subject to, for example, Islamic law. So I have been able to testify and have been able to influence the discussion uh, in many courts and also in many, many jurisdictions, some of them outside the U.S. Most recently, we've been focusing more uh, on the issue of domestic violence. Some women, and, and by the way, I was on the Virginia Domestic Violence Commission at one point, and this is not just a Muslim belief that some people think that it's okay, you know, the man is the head of the family and he can abuse the women. I have to tell you, at that commission, there were people from other, people of the cloth, from other religions, who held that point of view. So there is this deep misogynist, patriarchal view that misinterprets religion. And so it took me a long time to be able to go back to the origins of this issue and, and uh, write an article about it which explains to the women that God does not permit harm and that uh, they, have, they, they should never accept a treatment of this sort. But to do that, I mean, being a, a logician from philosophy, being a jurist uh, from my training in the law, and being a writer in Arabic from the old days, I was able to combine all this to go back to the original documents, a very difficult task, and, and show where it went wrong, who introduced misogynistic premises, and mix them, or tribal ones, or cultural ones, and mix them with the religious ones to come with, a, with the result that patriarchy would like. And so I had to tease all that out. And I, I went and lectured about all these things around the world. And I remember one time in one particular country where the US embassy had invited me to speak, um, they warned me that there were some fundamentalists in the audience and to be prepared for whatever might happen. And I said, that's fine, I can handle it. And in fact, nothing bad happened. They disagreed with me, but they couldn't refute what I was doing. And this is the tradition in the religion. You either refute it, or you be quiet. Where did I go wrong? Show me. I've been everywhere now with my views. Nobody dares tell me, as a woman, you cannot do Islamic jurisprudence. That is easily refuted. It's part of the history of Islam. Nobody can tell me this, this argument is wrong because you don't understand the meaning of this word. I am very skilled and talented in the Arabic language. And I can prove to them that I am right. So much so that this past summer, during Ramadan, which is the fasting uh, month for Muslims, I was invited the whole month by the King of Morocco to spend it in Ramadan. And I was chosen as the first American Muslim woman to give one of the very select and coveted <laughs> and second of all to decide that I'm not a crazy feminist who's trying to bring a set of values completely alien to them and change their society. Once they start listening to what I'm saying, they become more serious. So much so that by the third day when I finished, they asked me, they asked me if I could possibly give a public lecture in the Grand Mosque in that town, in the capital of that city, which was amazing to me. And I went. I said, of course I do. I mean, as I said, if I'm wrong, correct me. I'm happy to, you know, to hear it. I went and I gave my lecture. In front of me, like three rows behind the front row, there were three men who looked very traditional and who were really focused on what I'm saying. And then somehow at one point during the lecture, they started smiling and smiling, and maybe a little bit giggling, and then when everything was done, they left. The next day I found out that they were sent 
by the government as intelligence to find out what I'm saying so that they can stop it if I'm doing something terrible. And they were so satisfied, they were getting, they were smiling and smiling. You have to remember, I was talking about women's rights. But because of the way I was doing it, they didn't feel threatened. So I feel that I have been a change agent, not only at home, and we've done a lot with it. I, I, I will, let me, let me finish with one story about change agent at home. <clears throat> I remember when I started talking about all these things and explaining the American system, the constitutional system, how this country works to immigrants from countries, many of them, you know, Muslim immigrants. Again, here I was regarded by some of the older guys with suspicion. You know, like, why are you teaching, encouraging people to go vote in the system? to participate in this system, to become lawyers. This is a, a, a system which is secular, and therefore it is anti-religious. And I went to various main places in this country, cities, and lectured, begging people to, to sacrifice their children to the education in law. I said, you know, you're sending all your children to medicine. Make, sacrifice number two. Send them to law school. And some kids would come to me crying because they were about to go to law school when some religious leader in the community said, no, 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 don't get them there. This is a secular law. It is not a good system. You know what happened since then? There's a huge number of Muslim Students, male and female, who are playing a good role in this society, who understand the Constitution, who believe in voting, who believe in the system. I cannot say I did it, but I know that I was a very early voice in that. Medical school. 
my mother without a college education. There's probably 40 people I can bounce into in life who can say, oh, Mrs. Duffy helped me get to medical school. And these were not people of financial substance. These were people who um, actually, if they didn't get a scholarship and work full time on top of it, couldn't afford it to even go to school. My mother would go in and advocate to the president of the college why this person would make an excellent doctor. I took over that as a change agent. Um, as my mother started to slow down after her first stroke, she was in her 80s, I moved into onto a board of trustees where I helped develop nine health science schools. You see, everybody who knows me thinks I'm just a liberal arts, but what would the world be without liberal arts? We're wide thinkers. And uh, nine health science schools, everything from veterinarian, medical colleges, I've helped start two medical colleges, uh, vet school, dental school, pharmacy school, school of physical therapy, uh, school of uh, optometry school, podiatry, physical therapists, um, every part of health science that would serve the community. So I took that drive that I had to have a voice and it just didn't, that voice wasn't just for little old Maureen. That voice were for the voiceless. And, you know, there were only 28 vet schools in the United States when we started the 29th. We were threatened with a lawsuit because in our charter, we believed you didn't have to kill and murder animals in order to make the next group of animals well. We didn't allow first year vet students to harm animals. We made them work with modalities and, 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 and things on the computer and software and imaging and all of a sudden they came, the, the, the accreditation came down to the school and said, what do you mean? What is this? And I remember standing next to the dean that I had assisted in hiring and I said, why don't you wait till you see what our board scores look like? Our board scores in all of our schools are in the top half of the nation, and they continued to climb. That was my voice, because I knew it wasn't just about Maureen. It wasn't about Maureen trying to get a voice to be a lawyer in a courtroom and win cases. No. This was about Maureen taking her voice for the voiceless and making opportunity that's going to benefit everybody in the community. Because how happy are you? I have a five pound white poodle. It is my husband's blonde girlfriend. <laughs> my husband's right over there. Four and a half hours on the plane. Four and a half hours on the plane. I miss my sweetheart. <laughs> Because we had to put her in the spa. Unconditional love and never ask for anything. <laughs> he said if you locked your wife and your favorite dog in the trunk of the car and came back in an hour, we'd be happier to see you. That is his life. <laughs> I said I would have fashion the night and come out to the But not Princess, she loves him. But when you are traumatized at looking the, at the thing that you love and needing help, you go to the corner, you can't find a vet. That's traumatizing, all right. I've literally given mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to resuscitate an animal that made it. But you know, everyone understands their community and their community needs. Just are you willing to share your time and your contacts and your energy to make sure those needs are filled? I couldn't have gotten into medical school, but I helped start to. So being a change agent, it's, it's something that happens. And here is, we all have defining moments. That moment where you clicked, you know, you just kind of went crazy one day. I always look good when I'm crazy. That's half of the job of a judge. Don't let them know what you're thinking. Like, after you hear someone lie under oath for a half hour, you go, well, thank you, Mr. Pinocchio, you may step down. <laughs> I couldn't believe it came out of my mouth. 
Um, we all had these moments. <laughs> I remember when I was graduating from the eighth grade, and I was really in the get the voice Maureen business. I wanted to go to an all women's high school run by the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart. If any of you know about the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart, mm, the Pope was busy taking away their Sisters of the Immaculate Heart medallion. They were such obstreperous type of women, you know? They were going to stand up for what they thought. They were artists, they were athletes, they were real change agents. Problem is, I didn't get in. Oh yeah, I didn't get in. I remember opening up the letter. I didn't get in. But my girlfriend Martha got in. And she had the same kind of lackluster grades I did. Did I tell you I was a late bloomer? And I was just devastated. So I said to my mom, I said, Mom, Martha got in, but I didn't get in. And she goes, well, you know, and this is the point. This is what men have known for many years. But women were really excellent at it. I apologize to you guys, but you know what I'm talking about. My mom said, oh, well, Martha's mother's on the board of directors. Why don't you go down the street, knock on the door, and ask her what you could do better with your resume and application for next year's class. My mom, as you noticed, didn't say, go over there and see if she can get you in. No. She said, see what you could do to improve how you present yourself. So we walked down the street, and I walked up to this lovely front door, and I knocked on it, and the mother opened the door. And I told her my circumstance. And she said to me, Maureen, I cannot help you. And she closed the door. Amazing. As I walked down the street, I started to cry. My mother's standing next to me, walking with me. She says, what are you crying about? I said, did you see what happened there? She said, that's real life, Maureen. Get with it. <laughs> And what are you going to do about it, sister? <laughs> and I said, well, I'll tell you this, Mom. I will never turn away anyone who legitimately needs my assistance. And so, consequently, I have about 200 kids throughout a year that I mentor. And you're saying, how can you mentor 200 kids? Well, it's not constant. But I speak in a program called Youth Citizenship, YCS, at a school called Pepperdine University. And there's almost 300 kids every year, and one of my friends helps underwrite it, Maggie. And they go five, for five days free. Five days free, live in a dorm in this gorgeous campus, kids from all over, some are living in cars, some are living in Bel Air and Beverly Hills. They're all heaped together. And I and George Foreman and Ben Stein and a few other really kind of interesting people lecture and reveal ourselves. And I put up on the board my email and I tell them, if you ever need me, I'm here for you. And I get so many kids contacting me all year that, oh, at least half a dozen times a year, I'm swearing in those kids into the bar. I meet them in the 11th grade, and we talk all the way through law school, and I swear them into the bar, or I give them their hood when they graduate medical school or a health science school. So agent of change, it's a state of mind somebody willing to meet what are the needs of the community, and I enjoy every last minute of it because to Marty's mom, you didn't affect me, you spurred me on. <laughs> <laughs> One here, another one, one over here, one, two, three, okay. 
if I could get a succinct response from each of you, many times discrimination is overt, the barrio. Uh, blacks don't want to work in federal government. Women can't go to law school, for example, or how Muslim women are treated. Give us some examples of those unconscious or those covert mm. kinds of issues because that's what more often happens today. It's rare that someone will make such a blatant statement as blacks don't want to work in government, which quite candidly is racist. But they use other means in the selection process. So if you could give some examples of how you deal with those covert examples. Could I give you an over time at first? Because I didn't give any of those. <laughs> Not that they didn't happen. But I remember in one of my professional lives, academic lives, that before the uh, computers, I would write with pencil. So I would constantly be sharpening pencils. So I went to the secretary and asked her if she could get me a pencil sharpener. And she said, why don't you get an electric one? Everybody gets an electric one, it's easier. I said, fine, get me an electric one. So she did. I got called to the chairman's office um, when the, uh, a few days later. And he said, I understand you ordered an electric pencil sharpener. <laughs> and I said, yes, I did. I thought it was OK. He said, well, it would have been so much cheaper if you got a regular one and we hired an Arab to turn it. Ooh. Where were you at when this happened? <laughs> Regions do not signify necessarily where discrimination comes from. We have the wrong uh, stereotypes of people. This person should have been the most liberal. I helped recruit and hire him. Mm -hmm. And this is only one of various things he said. And in the end, he realized that he was going way overboard. Never mind, he was not the only one who did that. He could become president. Huh? <laughs> Excuse me? I said he could become president. <laughs> so let me tell you, for example, can, can I say just yeah. something overt? Covert, 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 is that I've noticed, I'll give you an example. I was invited at a very high level university. I don't want to say I believe or something else. And I was asked to comment on this presentation of somebody who is very famous. And she had decided to speak among other things, not only on Judaism and Christianity, but also to include Islam, because anyway, why not include it? And when she gave her presentation, uh, she said all sorts of stereotypical, false, demonstrably false things about Islam. So I just gave the facts. When the time came to comment, I said, you know, if you go look at verse this and book that, you will see that this is wrong. And when I left, nobody would talk to me. This is not the first time. In my career, when I do very well, I expect that people would frown at me. Also, I expect that whatever I have been promised to be published as a comment on the presentation doesn't get published. And they find, these are very famous, highly respectable people who find ways to not publish, even though it was supposed to be. I mean, I'm doing so well with the commentary, they know that. To the extent that they come and ask me to recommend them for really important <laughs> jobs. But they will not publish them. And in one case, one woman came to me and said, this is to show that women also oppress women. She said, we love you. You're, you're a great leader, etc. in the women's movement. Just drop this comment, which is supposed to be published, and do some other comment. And she told me, you know, I told her I'm not a follower. She told me what would be safer for me to do. And I said, what about freedom of speech? What about freedom of thought? She said, you're free, publish it anywhere else you want. But I will tell you, if you do what we ask you to do, you will, we will make of you an international leader. And I said, thank you, I thought I already won. <laughs>
focuses on higher uh, income countries sharing best practices with lower middle income countries. I think especially with uh, gender equality, there are several uh, amazing countries out there who are lower and middle income who are um, much, have a much narrower uh, gender gap than the United States does. And so do you have any experiences or advice on how the United States can learn best practices from these countries, whether it's uh, Rwanda or the Philippines, in closing that gender gap? Let me just, if I could take that one question. Please. Uh, I think the less, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the less money you have, you have to start relying on brain power. Right? So that is likely what's gone on in those in those locations. You just need someone to fix the broken leg. And if you've got the information and the talent to do it, you're gonna be the person that does it and everyone's gonna be grateful for your activity. I'll note that in Bulgaria where I did two terms, uh, as my Fulbright, um, <coughs> life-changing moments, every one of them, um, I noticed that there's a lot of women in the judiciary. They were just, you know, 20 plus years out of communism, the oppression of communism. Um, and they just know how to survive. They look for just the smart people. Uh, though that's not to say they don't, they're not dominated in their legislature by men. But I did notice that um, one of the nice and one of the better things, it's like when you talk about colonialism, you know, it left some good things, uh, not always appreciated, or not always that really worked with the culture that it, that it imposed it on, but colonialism was left something. Uh, communism left something with uh, those countries uh, under their uh, thumb, and a lot of it did have to do with gender equality. <laughs> Well, I may address this as well. You know, if you can't hear, I understand. How about now? Is it better? Yeah, I think you hit this probably by mistake. Oh my gosh, I'm not very good. Did I tell you they put me on the tech committee at court because I was the least tech? <laughs> they wanted to know what it was like to have somebody react. <laughs> I would like to say something about comparing the various countries. It is significant that you spoke of these countries as less affluent and more affluent. This is the way we look at, at countries and people in our society. Okay? Financial, consumerism, uh, capitalism. But in many of these countries who are becoming that way, they came from ancient cultures. 3,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, etc., where the standards were different. I mean, even the U.S. a while back wasn't like that, right? But like Protestant ethics and all that, it was a little bit different. So they had different ways of looking, for example, at women. Um, I like to watch on American TV, on Dish Network, <laughs> um, foreign uh, TV stations just to see what's going culturally, what's going on there. You would be surprised to see how many sons in the programs or in soap operas or whatever bend down and kiss the feet of their mothers. Okay, that's part of the tradition. So I'm not saying these are matriarchal traditions, not at all. I've already spoke about patriarchy throughout history, but I'm saying they, they have different ways of having problems with women than necessarily we have. And so, for example, in some of these countries, when we brought our way of looking at things, the status of women went down. Because we commercialized women's bodies, okay? We objectified the woman. This was not there in their culture. So now you see, we have a hodgepodge of values that are not working together right, and people have difficulty to try and fix the inconsistency and uh, tension within their society if they're trying to uh, get a paycheck or, or get enough food day to day. Uh, that's where people like us can come in and try to resolve these cultural issues. 
okay? But I do think that there is a lot we can learn from all sorts of traditions out there. And the one thing I would wish we would learn about is something that the feminist movement in the 60s raised here, and I don't know why we haven't heard about it since, is that we have commercialized the women's bodies. And it really bothers me to see women again on TV in ads selling uh, cars, selling toothbrushes, so, selling I don't know what. Uh, we need to regain the dignity for women in our society in, in, a, in a better way than just talking about mechanical equality. We need also psychological respect.